right there, geezers. Jules here from FGS, home of the Future Game Show. And you know what I hate the most about being a gamer? It's the game overs, my friend. Is there anything worse? Well, I guess there's microtransactions, there's the shady corporate practices, there's the toxic fan bases, and indeed the fact that we're sliding as an industry towards just homogeneity in the AAA. I tell you what, let's just stay on focus, Jules. This is meant to be a short intro. Game overs, they're bad. But you know what? There are some games that actually go above and beyond when it comes to booting you out of the experience, either allowing you to go down a truly deranged path where you come to realise your own mistakes, or put in the extra effort to showcase cutscenes and unique dialogue that basically inform you how utterly boned you are. As such, these moments have kind of become worth seeking out. They're game overs that players want to see, and wouldn't you know, that is exactly the name of this week's deep cut laden list with Jules Gill, baby. So, so let's have a chat about them. So I'm Jules, this is FGS, and these are eight secret video game game overs you want to see. And you know the drill, this is the deep cut with Jules Gill, baby. So we're going to be talking about games you've not heard of, thought about, or need to know more about. Let's get on with it shall we? Oh yeah, happy 2024. Whee! This is the first video I'm not recording of the year. New webcam as well. Ooh, ah, don't I look nice? No, Jules, you just look tired. Number eight, Blood Rain's Bloody Bridge of Boom. And that's boom with a B, not doom with a D. So friends, let's turn our focus and fangs to the oft-forgotten vampire action game Blood Rain, which, if we're honest, was a poor man's Blade, Tomb Raider, and Matrix all blended into kind of something that tasted a bit like mushroom paste. And if you like the flavour, you weird old chap, then of course Blood Rain's over-the-top cheese was going to be for you, but for the rest of us out here in the mainline gaming core, it was just kind of like a middling game. It was like 6 out of 10, 6 out of 10. <laughs> Blah. <laughs> Still, whatever you thought of its floaty combat and cringe edge lord dialogue, Blood Rain did possess a rather humorous way for our vampiric hero to bite the big one, courtesy of a super pad Nazi and an exploding bridge. The classic combination. I don't know how the editor's going to show a Nazi, by the way, on uh, and be YouTube friendly. So maybe just put like a fuck Nazi sign there. That'd be great. In fact, have I got one around? Got one around there? No, I've just got one that says fuck Tories instead. Now, as you enter Act 3, the bridge's infamous bridge section, winner of the 2003 Generic Villain of the Year award, Jürgen Wolf appears behind you, and despite possessing all the power of the Flash, the Human Torch, and the best Marvel character of all, eyepatch-wearing dude, decides to run past you and only deliver the most feeble of attacks as he does so. I can only imagine, like all Nazis or right-wing dickheads, that he's so deathly afraid of women that that's all he could muster. Oh, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? However, what he has achieved is the total and logic-defying destruction of the bridge that you're now standing on, which now proceeds to explode behind you, forcing you to sprint to the other side. And what's that waiting for you over the other side? Well, I'll tell you what, if you didn't say more Nazis, then you're gonna look like a real fool, so I'll let you change your answer real quick again. That's right, it's more Nazis! In fact, there's so many of them that you might reach into your leather-covered arson hole and pull out a rocket launcher to be done with all of these rotters, which will make your traversal all the easier. Yes, for some reason the devs not only anticipated that somebody would try this, but also programmed in a special game over if you did it, as by firing the rocket you'll infuriate Jürgen to the point that he runs back along the bridge, breathes fire at your feet, and then flees once more as the area underneath you collapses and you fall to your death. I don't know what's the most unhinged thing about this scenario, the running animation, the fact that your character does nothing to stop it happening, or the fact that the devs clearly anticipate that somebody would do it and went out of their way to punishing you for using the rocket launcher. It's just like, why? Why even give them the option of doing that? That's the big bad of the game just standing there. Why make it so that the player is punished for trying to kill him early? Just don't have him there! Nothing at all! Right, okay. Number seven, the Brickster ushers in the apocalypse, Lego Island. Okay, friends, let's turn the clock all the way back so that both the hands land on the brand new number of fun team, because we're going to be talking about a nostalgic deep cut, but one that will leave you feeling all warm and fuzzy inside. That's right, it's time to talk about Lego Island. 
Even stating this game's name will likely conjure up big blocky memories amongst those who played this as a youth. And likely it will run in slideshow fashion in your mind as well, seeing as this game rarely broke like 10 FPS when playing it. And alongside those memories is likely a familiar face. The bandit with a heart of gold, the Brickster. <laughs> Tell you what a cheeky little chap he was, running around, pushing things over, just stealing little things here and there. <laughs> Ushering in the apocalypse, what? Yeah, that's right, if you mess up enough in this game by just wandering around and not addressing the Brickster's escape in the opening section, the Brickster will destroy a ton of buildings and then, when enough destruction has been palmed out, a cutscene will play which shows the entire area warped into an utter hellscape. And even the Brickster seems to know that he's royally screwed up in this ending, as after laughing about how the island is all mine, he then stops and looks around before saying, Mine? And things get even worse in the scrapped extended bad ending in which you can see so much more suffering of the local populace. And then the funeral march song plays at the end, suggesting in no subtle way that this island is beyond doomed, it's dead brother. Now that, that, that's pretty rough. That is probably not what you'd expect when booting up Lego Island for the first time, right? Well, it's not as bad as it looks. Uh, well, maybe it is. And I tell you, that was a pretty sad ending, right? But you know what? Let's make sure that that doesn't happen to the FGS YouTube channel, brother. That's right. It's time for me to do that call to action thing where I say, please, please subscribe. Go on, help us out on this channel here, mate. If you enjoy the content that I and my colleagues do, then please consider subscribing because you'll be staying up to date with all of our daily gaming content and you'll be notified whenever the Deep Cut with Jules Gill baby goes live every single Friday. Do it. Do it now. Don't make me come over there. I won't, it's your personal space, but still, please. Number six, the AI can win? Uh, big rigs over the road racing. So you're probably looking at this entry and thinking to yourself, Jules, you 18 wheeler skid marker, can't parker, what are you on about, mate? You have been talking, waxing lyrical, in fact, about how stanky big rigs through the fucking road racing is on both the FGS channel and even in your past jaunt over on What Culture Gaming. Good people over there, go follow them. But still, I get what you're coming at, mate. I do understand because I've told you again and again and again that because the AI was so utterly broken in this game, it can't actually cross the finish line. It stops right before there, right? And this was even after a patch for the game that came out, because originally the game was that it would start and you'd immediately win because the AI wasn't actually programmed to race at all. So the patch came out and said that the AI can race-ish. They can move at one mile an hour, but they will stop before they get to the finish line. But you know what? People haven't questioned why that is. People are always just like, well, it's just badly programmed. But why would they patch it and still not allow them to win? Well, I'll tell you what, my friend, it's because it was never programmed for the AI to actually ever cross the finish line. And if they do, the game crashes. So of course, what do you think that most fans looking to go into this game and try and fix it, try and do first? They push them over there and they get that secret game over. That hard crash, that one that we are all yearning to see, yet only a few actually have. It's a weird entry, this one, because like I say, this is actually a game over that doesn't technically exist, but that's only because there was never an existence for them winning in the first place. It's something that we all want to see, yet for some reason, by the developer's hand and the cruel twist of fate, we never will. Did you enjoy that ramble? I have, an, I have a script here, and I just went completely off piste. I'm bloody piste, mate. So what I'm trying to say is, is that when Big Rigs Over the Road Racing 2 comes out, please let us lose. I'm so tired of being a winner. I'm so tired of being a winner. Is a statement I'll never say outside of this game. Number five, working for the worst ending, Zone of the Enders. Now, if you've ever found yourself looking over the writhing book of madness titled The Worlds and Inner Turmoil of Hideo Kojima and found all of the weaponized cans of piss, obtuse plots, and bum numbingly long cutscenes a little too much, then fret not, my friend, as the Master of Madness also had a hand in creating titles that didn't take a degree in philosophy and a master's in waffling to fucking understand. Say hello to Zone of Enders, a mech shooting action spectacle that was all trousers and much less mouth than Kojima's other titles. This was rather than an irradiated rad brooch and I was so very in on this experience as a wee lad. Yet just because the experience was more streamlined and the musings on the meaning of life kept to a minimum, I mean we can't ever say it's absolute zero because come on this is a Hideo Kojima joint, it doesn't mean that the auteur director didn't posit some secret content deep up in those Enders zones and in all honesty 
it's a pretty mad discovery. For you see, he got the team to program an alternate you done fucked up ending to the game that could only be unlocked by barely completing missions and attacking civilian settlements. It's a process that sees you go out of your way to disrupt the local bus services and clog public bathrooms, to the point that it kind of feels petty. And the reward you get for being an utter lout? Well, you lose the game in cataclysmic fashion. Upon attempting to rendezvous with Thunderheart, the conversation will be cut short when he straight up explodes thanks to you turning the local power supply stations into leaky Swiss cheese. The game then explains in great detail how maybe giving a 15-year-old a monstrous Gundam with a world-ending arsenal might not have been a good idea. And to cap it all off, your onboard AI says basically, uh, yeah, you killed him, you idiot, well done. This is your fault. Whoops, whoopsie, looks like we've got a big whoops on all three here. What happened? Jehuti fired at the colony block and hit one of the underground lifelines. In other words, you killed him. But I didn't mean... Are you happy now? Still though, for its sheer brazenness to mock the player and the fact that it's only possible to see this by actively being bad, those few who've come across this secret game over, well they truly wanted to see it. They're odd people, I tell ya. Number 4. A personalised game over. Torin's Passage. When it comes to game overs, very few offer the diversity and regularity of deaths as the point-and-click adventure genre. Around every corner there lies the option of being beaten to death by a bear in King's Quest, having your skin melted off by acid in Brain Dead, or getting such an extreme case of venereal disease that you die on the spot, courtesy of good old Leisure Suit Larry. Fun times, right? <laughs> In fact, there are so many ways to drop dead in this genre that, of course, some of these are going to be far less well publicised than others. And so we turn to the deep cut of Torrin's Passage, which released in 1995. And here you will quite literally get to meet your maker in one particular game over, as it's actually narrated by the game's creator, Al Lowe. In order to see this rather bizarre ending, you need to carry around a set of bagpipes with you throughout the majority of the game. And then, when finally faced to a... Well, to back with the main villain, you use these bad pipes to alert her to your presence. Now I'm all for a fair fight here, but maybe, just maybe, having a little doot on the old tutor to alert her to your presence wasn't the best idea, seeing as you get absolutely creamed, and by that you get turned into a human matchstick. A burnt one. It ain't pretty. Now at this point you might feel your face start to get extremely warm and flush, almost like the shame and embarrassment of using a bagpipe on the final boss is now eating you up from the inside out. However, what's this? That's not shame you're feeling, but the heat of the warming glow of Allo descending from the heavens. He be to mock you gently, but also kind of thank you for being so utterly mad as to try this concoction of items. In this game over, Allo congratulates you for finding this super secret easter egg and how mad it is that you got to the final boss of the game and decided to smash out it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll in place of beaning her in the back of the head with a rock or something before then closing out the monologue by encouraging you to maybe try something else. Congratulations, you did it! That's nice to see someone else has an Aldo sense of humor. Anybody who comes all the way through this game asking everybody you meet about this evil sorceress named Licentia and then finally finds her and then tricks Dreep into following a recording of her voice and then doesn't use the Book of Magic on her but instead plays the bagpipes deserves much more than just another boring old death message. Thank you, Al Lowe, for your weird mocking and, and dedication to the craft. Cheers, cheers. Good on you, mate. Good on you. Number three. Just nah. Golden Sun. Now, taking up the mantle of a hero in a video game is always going to be a bit of a tall ask, isn't it? I mean, you've got a lot of weight on your shoulders now. You've got the responsibility of maybe not just the nation, but the entire world. And you've got an ungodly amount of paperwork that is just marked with party management on the horizon for you. And worst of all, you've got to go through every single town from here on after with people yelling, Chosen One! He's the Chosen One! The Golden the child of light, the chosen one. Please, I have a name. I'm not a heroic piece of meat. So is it any wonder that some so-called heroes might want to actually just pass on the chance to wade through the pre-patched blight town at seven frames a second? Or maybe let somebody else take down Scrotus the teabagger whose unwashed actions have been terrorizing the world? Well, legendary RPG Golden Sun lets you do just that, giving the player the opportunity to just say, Nah, I'm, I'm good, thanks, and just peace out on the entire main quest. Because after hearing what Mr. Monopoly's Wish Edition cousin has 
has to say at the start of the game, you're presented with a choice. Will you accept responsibility for the fate of the world? Brother, I'm like, what, like 10 years old in this game? I haven't even responsibly taken control of a proper bedtime yet. I'm two primes deep and raring to go anywhere but there. So nah, I'm good. See you later. Let somebody from year 11 take this on. And what happens next is that if you answer negatively to this, even other characters chime in saying, yeah, you know what, fair one, I'd not want a piece of that action either. And they let you leave the cave and the game to the sound of the cast shrugging and saying, ah, well, we did our best, right? I mean, we asked him twice and he said no, and maybe we should have stressed the fact that it was the end of the entire world if he did say no, but yeah, uh, you know, we tried our best. We tried, we tried the bare minimum. We tried the bare, we, I mean, we could actually still go out and get like an army together. No, we all good? Going down going down the, the frog and trumpet for a pint, is it? With Patrick Stewart from the Yorkshire Tea Anthers. Yeah, fair. Yeah, fair one, mate. Number two. You suck. Rise of the Triad. Now let's talk about the cult classic and deep cut FPS game Rise of the Triad, where your goal is to infiltrate a mysterious cult and ask some serious questions of their leader, El Oscuro. And by this, I mean shoot every member of the clergy in the face and shove a double barreled shotgun right up Oscuro's backside. Which admittedly may be a bit of a problem because you see old Oscuro over here, he's kind of brought a magic to a gunfight and will routinely leave you with so many holes you'll be like, whoa, I never thought I'd get to see my own spleen. Cool. And the worst thing is, is that El Oscuro has been a busy boy, aside from shooting you full of, well, magical lead, and that he's been laying larvae around everywhere. Ew, gross. And that kind of creates a bit of a problem for the team, because if you somehow miss even one of the eggs in the final level, you'll unlock a bad ending, which is as comical as it is downright insulting to the player. Thanks to their botch, the team celebrate and leave the island in classic early gaming fashion, i.e. we read about it in text with a single brightly coloured group picture. However, many years down the line, the forgotten offspring somehow takes up the mantle of dear old dad and launches an attack on the globe, reducing it to ash. Now, I'm no expert in world domination, seeing as I lack the intestinal fortitude to hold on to a phone conversation for more than three minutes, but even I could probably say that maybe, maybe reducing the area that you now claim to yourself to be king over into a an irradiated pile of ash probably wasn't the best idea. I mean, not only have you destroyed all the cities there, but they've also destroyed most of the workforce that would allow you to rebuild in your own image. I'm not calling you an idiot, but you're a fucking <laughs> idiot. Still, who am I to argue as I'd be dead in this scenario, and I tell you what, I'd be spinning in my grave like a goddamn Beyblade if I heard what this game then chooses to dole out to the player. You suck. Thanks for that, that's good for the self-esteem. That's right, the game not only handed you an irradiated pie in the face, but put anus soul in your contact lenses with this verbal put-down. Seriously, Rise of the Triad, was destroying the actual world not enough? You had to put the boot in, didn't you? Still, that's pretty funny. And number one, no, no, yes, Lifeline. Okay, friends, let's end this in classic deep cut fashion by talking about a game that I am pretty sure that none of you, apart from maybe like five people, have actually heard of, and even less of them have played, like three of them. Three people, and I'm one of them. We're going to talk about Lifeline. Now, what makes Lifeline so special, I hear you ask? Well, it's a PS2 game, action, adventure, style thing, it's a bit of a survival horror elements. Oh, also... You don't control the main character, you just give her commands using your voice. Oh yeah. The premise is one that sounds brilliant on paper as long as you ignore the immediate follow-up question of but won't this handle like absolute ass? And yes, it does, because rudimentary PS2 era computer controlled AI being assisted through voice commands, likely delivered through a microphone so fuzzy that even the band Red Fang asked them to clean up their tones means that, yes, a lot of things can go wrong. I mean, f*** it, what could actually go right here? Well, if you fall prey to this technological nightmare fusion, you might find yourself going right back to the bloody start menu after just a few minutes, as it's possible to tell main character Rio here that you don't want to help her on her quest to escape this monster-filled hellhole. After helping her out of her jail cell and defeating a monster that kind of looks like a portion of meatloaf was fused with an anglerfish, she'll turn to the camera and say that you make a bloody good team, Lake. Now, normally, you'd be like, let's do this. But unfortunately, she wouldn't see the finger guns that you've just done there. And there'd be an awkward pause as you try to explain what you've just done. And she'd be like, 
completely unnecessary. Just do, let's just do this would have been completely fine enough. And you carry on your merry way. But there is just one problem, and that one problem is the entire game's premise because of the fact that the voice commands here are so bad at recognising you if you have even the slightest tinge of an accent. The slightest accent over here, then that means that the game will just be like, I don't have a fucking clue what you're saying, mate. So I'm just going to say, you think you said no? So you'll be screaming at Rio saying, yes, I will help you. I will go to the ends of the earth of you. I will help out. And the game's just hearing, nope, 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 don't like you. Nope, 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 nope. And the best part is, is that after three or four attempts of trying to get her to agree with you, she'll just get out a gun and just shoot the camera and be like, fine, you don't want to help me then. Game over. Now, it's a pretty damning indication of the quality of these voice commands if you saying yes is read as do one and will make you feel like you're on bloody toast of London. Yes! 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 Yes, I can hear you, Clem f <coughs> Pandango! Yes! Ah! Lifeline. More like, I'm on life support after playing you. Because you gave me a cardiac arrest. And there we go, my friends. Those were eight secret video game game overs. Hope you enjoyed that. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. And remember, if you want to chat to me, calm down, microphone arm. If you want to chat to me on the meantime, between these videos, the deep cuts that I come out every single Friday, then you can do so by going over to X or Instagram, where I'm at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. You can follow me there for my Warhammer posts. I do lots of painting. I'm getting back into the swing of things now, posting more regularly. And you can also follow my lovely editor over here as well. Give some love to the people that create this wonderful stuff. And I've also had to piece together four fucking <coughs> videos because the webcam decided to crash on the video side. Probably do the same right about now anyway. So I'm just going to keep talking. There'll probably be a still image. If that actually has happened, I will eat my own bloody socks, mate. I'm a bit annoyed about it is what I'm trying to say. And I love the fact this just gone out of focus there. I'm right fucking <coughs> here, mate. Hope you're having a great start to your 2024. Big love to you. Treat yourself well and remember... We're going to get through this together. So let's have some fun while we do it. Big love. See you next week. Bye.